In second case, conductor is stationary, flux is moving. So EMF will induce. In third case, both of them are stationary, the EMF will not induce. If both uh, arrangements move at the same speed, the EMF will, induce, will not induce. Correct. So that means either the plug should be stationary or conductor should be stationary. Other parts supposed to be moving, then only the EMF will induce. So here you can see, first one is, in, you can take the transformer. In transformer what happens? The conductor is stationary, flux is moving. Flux is moving means you are exciting the primary winding with the single phase supply. So the, you are producing the alternating flux. That means time varying flux. The flux is varying with respect to time. The conductor is stationary. So what will happen? EMF is induced in the secondary. That is first EMF is induced in the primary. That flux uh, traveling through the core that links the secondary. So EMF is induced. So the EMF induced in the transformer is called statically induced EMF. In any machine, if conductor is stationary, flux is moving means that EMF is statically induced EMF. In general, the EMF is two type. One is statically induced EMF and the other one is dynamically induced EMF. The statically induced EMF, the conductor should be stationary, the flux should be moving. So that is called statically induced EMF, it is also called as transformer EMF. Whereas in DC generator what happens? Flux is stationary, conductor is moving, that is a field system. It's a stationary part that is produces the plus, field plus, that is main plus. Then you are rotating the armature in the field path, so conductor is moving. That is called dynamically induced EMF. So other name is called generator EMF. So there are two EMF. Okay. Now, uh, this is the case. In uh, case of the DC generator, field is stationary. Okay, so you have the plus line. DC generator, the field is stationary. So suppose if you arrange the two-pole system, so in between there is a plus line, correct? So if you separate to uh, magnetic pole, uh, there is, if you separate with some gap, in between there is a plus line. So there is no physical appearance for plus line, okay? So now you can place the armature here, then you are rotating. So that is mechanical input you are giving. Mechanical input you are giving, so the armature is rotating. EMF is induced. What will happen? What type of EMF will induce in DC generator, whether AC or DC? AC will induce, correct. Okay. So in any generator, generates AC. That means even in DC generator, generates AC. Okay. But using commutator arrangement, we are converting that AC into DC. Okay. So even DC generator generates AC, we are purposely converting that AC into DC because DC generator is supposed to give DC output. So we are converting AC into DC. So what is the function of rectifier? It converts AC into DC. That is electronic rectifier. What is the function of commutator? It is also converts AC into DC. So the commutator is also called as mechanical rectifier. Where the EMF is induced in the DC generator, whether the EMF is induced in field system, in armature system, armature system. Okay, field is, system is producing only flux. Uh, the EMF is induced in the armature. That uh, induced armature, uh, EMF is alternating in nature. So the armature is supposed to be rotating part. Okay. So if in case of DC generator, if armature is stationary, field is rotating, whether uh, are you able to realize the DC generator? Are you able to realize the DC generator? If field is rotating, armature is stationary. Whether DC generator is possible? Not possible, correct. So in DC generator, the armature is supposed to be rotating. Compulsory, it should be rotating part. Otherwise, uh, uh, DC generator is not possible. Okay. So this thing you have to know. So in arm, uh, DC generator, the compulsory, the armature is supposed to be rotating part. Field system supposed to be stationary part. So here, you can see the using commutator, the bidirectional EMF is converted into unidirectional. Then this is the uh, one view of uh, uh, armature in DC generator, the commutator and brush assembly. Then uh, this you know the expression E equal to BLV sin theta. So EMF in DC, in DC generator is proportional to BLV sin theta. B is the flux density. Okay. L is the length of the conductor, V is the velocity. Theta is the angle between the flux line and uh, conductor surface area. So this is the EMF equation. Another uh, EMF equation, EG, by Z10 by 16 to P by A. So in any DC generator, flux is proportional to EG. More flux, more EMF will induce. Then EZ is the total number of conductor. Okay. So more conductor, more conductor will cut the flux, EMF will induce. Then uh, N, 
speed. When, uh, if you rotate the arm to, to very high speed, more time the conductor will cut the flux, so EMF will induce the number of holes. Instead of two holes, if you have four holes in the DC generator, more flux inside the machine, so more EMF will induce. But uh, the total number of conductor and the number of holes uh, is fixed. Once the machine is designed, that is fixed. We cannot vary. But by adjusting the field current, by adjusting the field current in DC generator, generator you can vary the flux so that you can vary the generated uh, EMF. Similarly, by adjusting the prime mover speed, you can control the speed of the DC generator so EMF will induce. Even if you use permanent magnet, in case of electromagnet, if you use permanent magnet in DC generator, even you cannot vary the flux. The only variable uh, parameter is speed. By varying the uh, prime mover speed, you can control the generator voltage. Okay. So, uh, DC motor, this two uh, equation is the basic equation. If you know these two equation, you can imagine uh, any advanced concept in uh, electric uh, DC drive. Okay. So, uh, here uh, we can enter into the machines too. So, uh, you know the basic of DC generator. In DC, uh, DC generator, the armature uh, uh, supposed to be rotating part. But in the AC generator, there is no restriction. Either the field can be rotating or armature can be rotating. Okay. So, there are, based on that, there are two types. So, now here you can see, so here uh, the uh, magnet, that is uh, flux is stationary, the conductor is moving. So, what will happen? So this is stationary, this is moving. So EMF will induce. Because there is a relative speed, EMF is induced. That EMF is alternating in nature. Okay, so here the conductor is stationary, you are moving the flux line. So what will happen? EMF will induce in the, once again in the conductor, what is the nature of that EMF? is alternating in nature. Okay, that nature is alternating in nature. So that means, so here there are two possibilities. Either the field can be rotating or it can be stationary. So according to the construction, the alternator, we have two types. Okay, one is rotating field, the stationary armature and vice versa. Okay, because there is no restriction. In case of DC generator, you know the field system should be stationary. Okay. Now, this is the two type of alternator according to construction. Stationary field, rotating armature, then rotating field, stationary armature. Then, uh, based on the rotor, there are two types. Okay, one is uh, saline pole rotor and another one is non-saline pole rotor. So, saline pole rotor means projector pole rotor. So, in this second, this is the saline pole rotor, this is non-saline pole rotor. So, what is the difference between these two? So, here this is uh, the poles are projected, here the uh, rotor is smooth cylindrical. So, that means here the air gap is uniform. In case of saline pole, non-saline pole alternator, the air gap is uniform. Here, air gap is not uniform. So, if air gap is uniform, you can uh, uh, use for high speed application. So, in non uh, <coughs> uniform, uh, that is suitable for low speed application. Okay. Then, this is the uh, first one is uh, rotating. This is the stationary armature, rotating field. Field is rotating. Okay. Then, here, this is the field is stationary, the armature is rotating. Okay. Now, so you can compare these two arrangements. So, this is the stationary field, rotating armature. Then, uh, this is stationary armature, rotating field. Once you have two types, automatically we have to decide which one is best. Okay. So, here, which one is best? So, rotating field, stationary armature is best. Why rotating field, stationary armature is best? Because you know the comparison. Okay. So, this is rotating field system. If the field is rotating, we, have, we need only two slip rings because for field system you have to give DC supply. So field is rotating, we, we need only two slip rings. So if armature is rotating, in case of three phase alternator, we need three slip rings. So normally the, all the generating station we have the 11 kV synchronous generator or uh, 33 kV. Uh, normally the generator voltage, uh, voltage level is 11 kV or 33 kV. So suppose uh, 11 kV or 33 kV means that voltage is very high. So that means, so we need the uh, uh, slip ring. So the armature, the induced voltage is 11 kV. So we are collecting that 11 kV from the rotating part. So that means the, there is a spark in the, uh, between the press and the slip ring. Okay. So, but uh, in case of uh, rotating field stationary armature, normally the DC voltage is 110 volt or 220 voltage we will give. So, compared to 11 kV, this uh, field uh, that 120 volt or uh, 110 volt or uh, 220 voltage is less. So, lesser spot. Okay. So, this comparison, you know, 
then uh, here the construction of uh, single generator so we can take the stationary armature and the rotating field okay so this is not a single matter so this is the uh, alternator stata so this is not a single matter this is made up of number of stamping okay stamping means uh, steel sheet okay normally the thickness of uh, stamping is 0.5 mm thickness maximum okay so all the stampings are laminated to reduce the eddy current loss normally the stamping is made up of good magnetic material to reduce the crystallization loss okay so number of stampings are arranged this is called core length this length is called core length okay this is the one of the design uh, data according to core length we have to arrange all the stampings then under hydraulic press we have to press then finally it looks like uh, this solid metal but this is not a solid metal okay made up of number of stampings so the inner periphery made up of number of slots to gauge the armature winding so in case of three phase alternator we will place the three phase uh, armature winding then uh, this is the winding uh, r wind d winding then uh, the, we have a single layer winding or a double layer winding in the armature then you know the basics uh, the pole pitch okay then uh, slot angle and all then uh, the rotor type i already mentioned only saline pole and non saline pole <coughs> so this is a saline pole rotor and this is non uh, non saline pole rotor in saline pole rotor you know the air cap is uh, not uniform in non saline the air cap is uniform now this is the another one view of the saline pole rotor and the non saline pole rotor so this is the comparison between saline pole rotor and the <coughs> non saline pole rotor in saline pole rotor the poles are projected here uh, not projected here air cap is uniform here not uh, non uniform the diameter is high in saline pole the diameter is high because the axial length is uh, uh, small okay the mechanically weak so in saline pole is mechanically weak so this is suitable for low speed application so normally the water turbine and ic engines are used so whereas the non saline pole is suitable for high speed application then you know the working principle of the Uh, generate according to faraday's law whenever the conductor touch the magnetic flux emf will induce this is the faraday law of electromagnetic induction so based on that so uh, if you have two pole uh, arrangement two pole uh, uh, alternator in one rotation uh, what is the emf induced 360 degree the emf induced is 360 degree if four pole what is the emf induced is 720 degree that is two cycle will induce that means from that you can develop the Uh, relationship between mechanical degree and electrical degree correct so for example so now uh, this is the two pole arrangement so now consider this is the assume there is only one slot in the armature so one rotation how many times this conductor links the plus two times only while coming under n pole the conductor cuts the plus one time then uh, under uh, yes uh, links the Uh, uh, plus links the conductor one time. So what is the EMF induced? That is one cycle will induce. That is 360 degree. Suppose four pole. So now consider. So N, yes, N, yes. Okay, four pole system. So now this is the uh, conductor. Okay, assume there is only one conductor or there is only one slot in the armature. Practically there is number of slot in the outer periphery of the armature. Here I am explanation purpose. I assume there is only one slot. In that slot, there is only one conductor. Now, in 360 degree mechanical rotation, what is the EMF induced? How many cycles will induce? N. Under N, one time it will cut. Then yes, one time. Here N, one time. Then four. Uh, that is two cycles will come. Correct. That is 720 degree. Okay. So in case of two pole, so in two pole, 360 degree, 360 degree electrical, 360 degree mechanical, 360 degree electrical. So in case of four pole, what is uh, 360 degree mechanical? It's 720 degree electrical. Now you can relate to these two. Okay. So we, you can form the generalized equation. There is one degree mechanical equal to P by two degree electrical. So this is the generalized expression. That is one degree mechanical equal to P by two degree electrical. Suppose Uh, here uh, two pole we can substitute to two okay number of pole p equal to two two by two equal to one so one degree mechanical equal to one degree electrical so in case of two pole so 360 degree equal to uh, 360 degree mechanical equal to 360 degree electrical okay so that means one degree mechanical equal to one degree electrical so if suppose four pole we can substitute here four so four divided by two that means one degree mechanical equal to two degree electrical okay that is 
1 degree mechanical equal to 2 degree electrical. So both the side you can divide by 360. So what will happen? So here, here 1 degree mechanical, here 2 degree electrical. Okay, that means this equation is a generalized equation for all the numbers of pole. Okay, so 1 degree uh, mechanical equal to phi by 2 degree electrical. Uh, this is the generalized expression. Then you, you know the EMF equation. So EMF equation, uh, the, you can start from basic, that is parallel of electromagnetic induction, E equal to d pi by dt. So d pi is the rate of change of flux, dt is the time taken for that rate of change of flux. Okay. So now, uh, uh, if you consider two poles, So if you consider two pole, so how many times the flux leaves the, uh, the conductor leaves the flux? Two times. So in case of four pole, how many times the conductor leaves the uh, conductor leaves the flux leaves the conductor? Four times. Like that, if you have P four, P ten. So P P five, D five. That of change of flux, D five equal to P five. Then time taken for the ground revolution is. 60 by ns, correct. Now you can substitute in that expression. So finally you have 5 p ns divided by 60. Uh, in generalized expression you know that is uh, ns equal to 120 f by p. From that you can derive 2f equal to p ns divided by 60. Instead of p ns divided by 60 you can substitute 2f. Okay, so finally you have the expression that is uh, uh, e phase equal to 4.44 kc kd by f d phase. So what is the equation for transformer? What is the equation for transformer, EMF equation for transformer? 4.44 pi m f n1. Correct, pi m f n1 for transformer. Okay, so E1 equal to 4.44 pi m f n1. Correct, so now you can compare these two equations. So here 4.44 or 4.44 same. So pi, here also pi. Then here frequency both the case. Then in transformer number of turns here turns. Okay. In transformer uh, the winding is not uh, distributed. Concentrated winding we are using. But in uh, in case of alternator the winding is distributed through in the all the slot. Uh, all the of the all the slot. So turns per phase you see. So here the KC, KD and factor is coming. Coil span factor and distribution factor. Uh, these two factor uh, in case of distributed winding we have to consider. Okay. For uh, full pitch winding the uh, KD equal to 1 then uh, uh, KC equal to 1 uh, for uh, the 180 uh, first slot and uh, uh, that is one end of the first turn in one slot then 180 degree the uh, second uh, turn is uh, second side is coming means KC equal to 1. So here now uh, we have the EMF equation. Now what are all the factors affecting the EMF equation? In any generator, the terminal voltage is supposed to be constant. So for example, uh, you can assume the DC uh, circuit I will uh, take. So now you can consider on a small uh, DC arrangement. Okay, now this is the 10 volt, uh, this is 1 ohm. Now what is the voltage across this uh, resistor? So 10 volt, correct. So what is the voltage across this resistor? 10 ohm. So now I am increased from 1 ohm to 100 ohm. That means I am increasing the load. Now what is the voltage across the terminal load? voltage across this 100 ohm resistor? Same 10 ohm. That means from 1 ohm to, uh, I vary from 1 ohm to 100 ohm, but the voltage across that uh, uh, load, here 100 ohm is the load, voltage across the load is constant. Correct. But uh, in alternate, uh, alternator not like that. No load that uh, the terminal voltage is scattered voltage. If you increase the load, what will happen? The terminal voltage decreases. Correct. But uh, in ideal case, uh, theoretically, uh, the terminal voltage is supposed to be constant from no load to full load. But practically, it will not be constant. It will vary from no load to full load. Okay, no load it will be high. Full load uh, it is decreasing. That difference is called. Uh, Voltage regulation, changing terminal voltage from no load to full load. So now what are the factors affecting the terminal voltage? So one is armature resistance and another one is leakage reactance, third one is armature reaction reactance. These three factors affecting the uh, terminal voltage of the alternator. Okay. So in case of uh, arm winding, uh, you cannot avoid the armature resistance because any winding has its own resistance. So armature resistance drop. Then leakage reactance. So the alternator uh, uh, generates AC. 
so automatically the frequency come into picture so if frequency comes automatically the reactance come into picture okay xl xl equal to omega l where omega equal to 2 pi f okay so if f equal to 0 in case of dc f equal to 0 the reactance equal to 0 so in case of ac there is a frequency so the reactance come into picture that will also reduces the terminal voltage another one is armature resistance then third one is reactance corresponding to armature reaction so the first two you can measure the third one is the imaginary reactance okay that is imaginary reactance uh, here armature resistance in this case, here uh, you can see the uh, EMF is induced in the armature. This is the terminal voltage. So the generated voltage should overcome this armature resistance. Uh, then only it will reach the terminal. Okay, so there is uh, some drop across the armature resistance. Then leak, similarly leakage reactants. Then armature reactants corresponding uh, to armature reaction. So now you can assume the armature reaction in DC generator. So what is the armature reaction in DC generator? Uh, effect of armature flux on the main flux. Okay. So only the armature uh, main armature flux affects the main flux. But in case of uh, alternator, the load type also affects the terminal voltage. Okay. So but in case of uh, DC generator, not like that. Only the armature flux affects the main flux. But here, the armature flux affects the main flux as well as the load type. Okay, you know the basic uh, uh, loads, uh, three types of load. Resistive load, inductive load and the capacitive load. So now you can assume the pure inductive load. So pure inductive load, so this is the uh, main flux. Then because of main flux, what will happen? EMF is induced in the armature. The angle between uh, flux and uh, EMF induced is 90 degree. The flux uh, EMF is always that plus by 90 degree. You know the mathematical expression for that, right? Uh, you know that, okay. So, the uh, flux and EMF is, uh, the EMF induced is always that plus by 90 degree. Now, uh, because of this uh, EMF, the current will flow, okay. This is uh, load current, IA. Now, the, okay. So uh, IA, then because of IA, the IA will increase, okay. Normally the current and the flux is in phase, voltage and uh, uh, flux is uh, 90 degree dash. Okay, now what is the angle between IA and IF? IA and IF 180 degree out of it. That means in waveform you can draw like this. This is the main flux, the data line gives the armature flux. That means the main armature flux always opposes the main flux. That effect is called the demagnetizing effect. Okay, in case of pure inductive load. Similarly, you can assume for all the cases. So in case of uh, uh, resistive load, the field flux, because of field flux, EMF is induced. Then because of resistive load, the angle between voltage and current, zero. Because of this armature current, the, this is armature flux. The angle between field flux and armature flux is 90 degree. So that means portion of the time the armature flux uh, assists the uh, main flux, portion of the time the armature flux opposes the main flux. Okay. So the net flux reduction is almost nil. So this effect is called cross magnetizing effect. Whereas in case of uh, uh, capacitive load, demagnetizing effect. So that means the armature flux and the main flux uh, in the same direction. That means the armature flux always supports or assist the main flux. So the net flux in the machine increases. This is called the magnetizing effect. Okay. So in alternator, there is a uh, gap. Okay. So here you can see. So this is the armature. This is the field. In between there is a gap. So here armature flux and here uh, field flux. Inside the air gap, we have two flux. Armature flux and uh, field flux. Okay. This two flux, there is no physical appearance. Okay. So that the armature flux opposes the main flux. Okay, so this is the one imaginary reactant. So armature reacts and reactants is the imaginary reactant. You cannot measure. Okay, so whereas the armature resistance drop and leakage reactance drop, you can measure. Then this is the that effect. So here the armature flux always supports the main flux. Okay, so normally the armature flux magnitude is less than the main flux magnitude. Okay, so this is the magnetizing effect in case of capacitive load. This is demagnetizing effect. Here, portion of the time it is assist, portion of the time it opposes. So, this is called cross magnetizing effect. 
So now voltage drop. What are the voltage drop in any alternator? We have three voltage drop because three factor affecting the terminal voltage. One is armature resistance and another one is leakage reactance. Third one is armature reaction reactance. Okay. So now uh, this is the generator voltage E phase. Okay. So that is equal to B phase. Terminal voltage plus IA RA. This is the one drop. IAXL then IAXR. So here this is the terminal voltage. Now you can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, Kirchhoff's voltage law, second law. So in any closed path, some of the potential rise equal to some of the potential drop. So here the E phase is the potential rise. These are the drops. So IARA, okay, plus IAXL plus IAXR plus B phase. Okay, so all are vector addition, not a scalar addition. Scalar addition means directly you can add. In case of DC generator, directly you can add, but in AC generator, all are with some angle, okay, different angle. So uh, you have to use the vector addition. That is E phase vector equal to B phase vector plus IARA plus IAXL plus IAXAR. Then XL plus XAR, that is leakage reactance plus R2 reaction reactance is nothing but synchronous reactance. One of the important term is synchronous reactance. XS, notation is XS. So, if you add this to the equation, reduce E phase equal to B phase plus IARA plus IAXS. XS we have two components, one is XL and the other one is XAR. Then RA plus JXS, RA plus JXS is nothing but rejectus, that is synchronous impedance. Okay, so V phase equal to, that is E phase equal to V phase plus IA ejectus. At that time, you can uh, write the voltage equation of the DC generator. What is the voltage equation of DC generator? EG equal to VT plus IARA. Okay, EG is the EMF induced in the DC generator, here V phase. Okay, then VT, VT is the terminal voltage, here uh, V phase is the terminal voltage. Then IARA, in case of DC generator, IARA, because in DC generator the reactants will not come. So IARA, here the reactants come into picture. So IA ejectus. So E phase equal to B phase plus IA ejectus. Okay, in case of DC generator, uh, scalar addition here, vector addition. Okay. Now this is the equivalent circuit of any alternator. Okay, this is the equivalent circuit. So if EMF induced, then uh, RA, then XS. This XS we have two components, XL plus XAR. This is the equivalent circuit of the alternator. Okay. Now this is the pressure diagram of the loaded alternator. Pressure diagram, you know. So from the pressure diagram, so here uh, you can assume the um, lagging power factor load. So I am uh, taking the uh, current as a reference pressure. So in lagging load, in that pure inductive load, if you take voltage as a reference, current is lagging. If you take current as a reference, voltage is leading. So IA, so the V phase, V phase is leading. Okay, so V phase is leading. Because I am taking current as a reference pressure, V phase is leading. So IA, RA drop. Okay, now you have to add all the drop. Okay, so V phase, IA, RA plus IA, X. That is nothing but E phase. We are adding. So V phase. IA, RA is the pure resistive drop. Pure resistive drop is always in phase with the current. So that is why I have drawn parallel to the current. Okay, so IA, RA. Then IA, X is the pure reactance drop. Okay, pure inductance drop. That is leading, 90 degree leading because we are taking current as a because we are taking current as a reference. So, this is IAXS. If you add this three drop, that is V phase, IARA plus IAXS. Okay, in previous slide you know. So, V phase, IARA plus IAXS. That is nothing but a E phase. Okay, so that, uh, that uh, this gives the E phase. So, from that you can develop the equation. So, generalized equation. So, that is for lagging power factor load, that is E phase equal to root of E phase cos by plus IARA the whole square plus V phase sin by plus IA excess the whole square in case of lagging power factor. In leading power factor, if here the minus will come, then the unity power factor, so here uh, the sin by becomes zero. Pi, pi equal to zero, sin by zero. So only IA excess will come. Okay, so you know, by combining these three equations, we can develop the generalized equation. So that is E phase equal to root of V phase cos by plus IARA the whole square plus V phase sin pi plus or minus IAXS to whole square. Plus for lagging power factor, minus for leading power factor. So while solving the problem, we can use this equation. Okay, so this is the voltage regulation I am already mentioned. Okay, change in terminal voltage from no load to full load. Okay, so uh, in ideal case, the terminal voltage 
uh, supposed to trace this data type. Okay. So from no load, this is the terminal voltage. For example, say 400 volt at full load. If you increase the load, the load can also increase. At full load, the, you have to get same 400 voltage. So it's supposed to be. The terminal voltage is supposed to be straight line or it should be parallel to the x-axis. But in practical case, it will, it will not be like that. So in case of uh, lagging per factor load, uh, the terminal voltage is decreasing. Why it is decreasing? Terminal voltage because demagnetization effect. Because demagnetization effect, what will happen? What is demagnetization effect? Uh, the armature flux always opposes the main flux. So the net flux inside the machine decreases. Net flux inside the machine decreases, automatically what will happen? The generated voltage decreases. You know the uh, EMF equation. E, e phase equal to 4.44 KC KD phi. So E phase and phi is directly proportional. So because of demagnetization effect, the net flux inside the machine decreases. So the terminal voltage decreases. What about uh, leading per factor? Magnetizing effect. So the net flux inside the machine increases. So the terminal voltage more compared to the generated voltage, D phase. Okay, D phase is the EMF induced inside the alternator, B phase is the terminal voltage available, that is outside the alternator. Okay, so unity per factor cross magnetizing effect. So that is why this deviation. So lagging per factor, the terminal voltage de uh, decreases because demagnetizing effect. Uh, here the leading per factor, uh, leading per factor load, the terminal voltage increases because magnetization effect. Okay, so you know the voltage, uh, voltage regulation expression. E phase minus E phase divided by V phase. So while solving the voltage regulation, you can see if you consider the lagging per factor, the uh, percentage voltage regulation always in positive. So if you consider the leading per factor, the percentage voltage regulation always in negative. Why? Because in case of uh, lagging per factor load, the V phase is less, correct? V phase is less compared to E phase. Okay, because E phase is the EMF induced inside the alternator. That will be more, terminal voltage will be less. So that means this positive term. So the positive term will be more, negative term will be less. That is why the terminal old, the voltage regulation is in positive. So in case of uh, leading per factor, the terminal voltage is more. Why terminal voltage is more? because magnetization effect. So the negative portion is more. So that is why the voltage regulation is negative. Okay. Now, uh, what are all the methods to determine the voltage regulation? In general, there are two methods, direct method and indirect method. This is common for any machine. Even if you take the DC generator, so direct method, indirect method. How will you calculate the efficiency using direct method and the indirect method? Direct method means you can uh, conduct open circuit test and short circuit test. Indirect method, you can have the direct load test. Similarly, for the DC motor, direct method, direct load method, uh, indirect method is the symbols test. Like the transformer, subconnect test is the indirect method, load test is the direct method. Like that, for uh, alternator also, we have two methods. One is direct method and another one is indirect method. So indirect method, there are uh, four or five methods. One is EMF method, MMF method, ZPF method, ASA method, and Brunner's method. So uh, out of these four methods, out of these five methods, the first four methods is suitable for only uh, non-saline pole alternator. Non-saline pole alternator means smooth cylindrical alternator. Whereas the Brunner's method is suitable for only uh, saline pole alternator. Okay. So now we have two methods, direct method, indirect method. Which one is best? We have two methods, automatically there is a question, which one is best? Okay, what is direct method uh, or indirect method, which one is best? So direct method means you have to load the alternator, you have to uh, connect the actual load with the alternator. Suppose if the alternator current rating is 2000 ampere, that means you have to load the alternator up to 2000 ampere. Okay, that means uh, you have to provide uh, such a huge uh, loading arrangement. Okay, that is not possible for uh, in all the cases. So if you conduct a load test, so all the energy, the electrical energy is converted into heat energy, almost it is waste. Okay. So direct method is suitable for low rated, low capacity alternator. For high capacity alternator, normally we will use the indirect method. So direct method is the accurate method, indirect method is the approximate method. Okay. So if you calculate voltage regulation using indirect method, that is not the actual uh, voltage regulation value. That value is somewhat higher than the actual value. So EMF, MMF, EJTF, ASA is the indirect method. So the EMF method is also called as synchronous impedance method. Why it is called a synchronous impedance method? In EMF method, first we are calculating the EJTS. Okay, first step. Uh, while solving problem in EMF method, the first step we are calculating the EJTS. 
that is equal to V phase divided by uh, ISC. Uh, start and put current for same field term. Okay. So that means you are calculating each other. So that is why this is called synchronous impedance method. Then another one is MMF method. It is also called as ampere turn method or regulation of round rotor or alternator or rotor MMF method. Then third method is the EZPF method or portier triangle method or general method. So in EZPF method, we are constructing the portier triangle. That is why this is called portier triangle method. So ASA method is also called as MMF method. So the ASA American Standard Association method. Okay. <coughs> EMF uh, electromotive force, uh, magnetomotive force. Then zero power factor, ZPF zero power factor. Then Blundell's method or two reaction theory. Sometimes it is referred as slip test. Okay. Now uh, direct method, you have to apply direct load. Okay. So uh, this is the tabulation. So you have to load the alternator gradually from more load to full load. You have to measure the terminal voltage. Then you can substitute the value in the uh, voltage regulation uh, exp uh, expression. Then you can calculate the percentage voltage regulation. Direct method. You know the drawback of direct method. Then another one is uh, indirect method. So first method, EMF method. So EMF method, we have to uh, conduct two, three tests we have to suppose to conduct. One is open circuit test and another one is short circuit test. The third test is the arm to resistance measurement test. Okay. So this is the arrangement. So this is the alternator. For this alternator, we are going to determine. Determine or pre-determine. Indirect method means pre-determination. Direct method means determination. In exam, they are asking uh, determination means you have to conduct a direct method in laboratory and say. Uh, determine the regulation of uh, uh, such alternator, particular alternator means you have to conduct the direct method. In the in indirect method means predetermined. They will use the word predetermined. Okay. So this is the alternator. For this alternator, we are going to predetermine the voltage regulation. So here this motor is going to act as a prime mover. Okay. So the prime mover may be DC motor or any electrical motor or diesel engine or water turbine or steam turbine, whatever may be. Uh, if you use in laboratory scale, so normally we will use the electrical motor. Okay, this is going to act as a prime mover. So normally uh, by adjusting, uh, you can start the motor. Then uh, normally while starting the uh, armature of the uh, field, uh, field of the uh, alternator should be maximum. The field of the motor should be minimum. You know the reason. Okay, so by adjusting this field rheostat, you can set the rated speed of the alternator. Suppose the rated speed of the alternator is 1500. Rated speed of the motor 1600. Whether you will set 1500 or 1600. You have to set 1500. Because we are going to do the experiment on alternator. The alternator rated speed is 1500. So you have to rotate the alternator at rated speed. So even though the rated speed of the motor is 1600, you have to set only 1500. You have to set the rated speed of the alternator. Okay. So most of the cases, the, they will select the prime mover such a way that uh, the, the arm, for example, the alternator speed is 1500, they will select the prime mover speed minimum 1500 or more than 1500. They will not select 1400 RPM motor for prime mover motor for prime mover for the 1500 alternator. Okay, 1500 RPM alternator. Okay. So now in open circuit test, the armature terminal is supposed to be open. That is why this is called open circuit test. In open circuit test, you have to draw the magnetization characteristics. So magnetization characteristics means which gives the relationship between open circuit voltage and the field current. Okay, so by adjusting the field current, yeah, by adjusting the field current, you have to take the uh, terminal voltage up to rated voltage. So usually even you can take the uh, residual voltage also. Then uh, short circuit test. While conducting short circuit test, the armature terminal is supposed to be short circuit. So you can use one ammeter to measure the short circuit current. Then uh, armature resistance, you can use the method. Different method is available. You can use any one method. You can measure the armature resistance. So the first step, uh, you can draw the open circuit characteristics and short circuit characteristics in the same graph. In single graph, you have to draw. Then eta test, you have, uh, you have to calculate. That is why this is called synchronous impedance method. So eta test is equal to open circuit voltage divided by short circuit current for same field current. Okay. So once you calculated the eta test, uh, that value, then armature resistance, you know, uh, purpose value, all are purpose value, then excess you can calculate. Once you have excess, you can substitute in the expression, E phase expression, you can calculate the E phase. Okay, so based on the E phase value, you can calculate the voltage regulation. This is the EMF method procedure and what are the limitations means? So here uh, the value, uh, voltage regulation value is normally more. 
compared to actual value. So that is why this is called the approximate method or pessimistic method. Then this is the MM of method arrangement. So there is no difference between EM of method arrangement, testing arrangement, and the MM method uh, testing arrangement. You have to use the same procedure, same uh, test you have to conduct, open sensor test, the source sensor test, and the arm surface test. Same tabular column you will have. The only uh, calculation is different. Okay. So here we have we have to use the field correct. Okay, so IF1 square, that is IF equal to root of IF1 square plus IF2 square plus 2 IF1 IF2 cos of 180 degree minus 90 plus or minus 5. Okay, so here we have to calculate the field current. So next one is HRPF method. So why the, this uh, such a method? Okay, why more number of method? One is EMF method, MMF method and HRPF method. Okay, so the EMF method on the drops are considered as the EMF quantity. So what is the EMF, uh, uh, what are the voltage drop, IA, RA drop, IA, XL drop, IA, XA, R drop, three drop. All these three drops considered as a EMF quantity. That is why this method is called EMF method. So in MMF method, all the drops are considered as a MMF quantity. MMF means flux, flux quantity. EMF means voltage, okay, voltage quantity. But in a real situation, IA, RA and IA, XL is the EMF quantity. IA, XA, R is the MMF quantity. Okay, in real situation. But what we are doing in EMF method, even the IA, XA, R is the MMF quantity. But in EMF method, we are considering IA, XA, R also EMF quantity. That, okay, that is, we are away from the reality. But in MMF method, so only IA, XA, R is the MMF quantity. But IA, RA and IA, XL is the EMF quantity. But uh, in MMF method, we are considering all the drop as a MMF drop. Okay, but in HRPF method, we are calculating voltage regulation as per as per the real situation. That means we are considering IARA and IAXL as a EMF quantity. IAXAR is the MMF quantity. Okay. So now here we have to conduct the open circuit test, short circuit test. Then additionally we have to conduct one more test that is called EJPF test. Zero power factor uh, test. Okay. Zero power factor. When you will have zero power factor lagging. When you will have zero power factor lagging, if pure inductive load. If you have pure inductive load, the angle between voltage and current is 90 degree. Okay, so uh, phi is 90 degree. So cos 90, okay, zero. Okay, so zero power factor lagging. So that means you have to use pure inductive load. Now using pure inductive load, you have to conduct the load test. So first you have to conduct open circuit test and short circuit test. Next you have to conduct the load test. Okay. Now, uh, already we have the open circuit test data, short circuit test data, then uh, open uh, the load test data. We need three test data. Okay, so first you have to draw the graph. So first you have to draw the OCC uh, graph. Next you have to draw the, uh, uh, this point, you have to locate this point. This point you can locate from short circuit uh, test data. Okay, short circuit test data. In short circuit, what is the voltage? Voltage is zero there will be some field current. So that field current you can uh, put here, field current, but the voltage is zero, y axis voltage. So zero voltage, that field current. Okay, then this is the EZPF data. Okay, in EZPF, at the full load, what is the terminal voltage, what is the field current? That point you can locate. By joining these two points, you should not uh, join using straight line. Okay, you have to join these two lines uh, parallel to this OCC curve. Parallel to OCC curve, you have to draw this curve. So this is called uh, this is called EZPF curve. Okay, so this is OC, OCC curve, this is EZPF curve. Okay, next you have to draw the uh, air gap line. So that uh, air gap line is the tangent line. That tangent is supposed to be at the time of starting. Okay, at the starting level, it should be tangent. Okay, you have to draw the uh, air gap line. Next, we have to construct the portier triangle. So, you can measure this length, okay, from this point to, uh, if, uh, suppose this is 5 centimeter piece, from this point we can draw 5 centimeter, then this line, CK line, we can draw, okay, that is parallel to air gap. Parallel to air gap, we can draw one line from K that will intersect uh, OCC at one point, that is called C. Now we can join the C point and the starting point. Okay, now we can draw one perpendicular line from the C. Or we can draw one line from C. That line is supposed to be parallel to Y axis. Okay, or it should be perpendicular to this line. Okay, so now here this is the IA XL draw. The CA is the length of CA is the IA XL. So this is this length. 
This length is the field current required to overcome the storm to react and react and stop. Okay. So this is called the Portier triangle. This is called the Portier triangle. Why this is called Portier triangle means the IAXL drop is called Portier drop. Okay, IARA drop, IAHAR drop, IAXL drop. IAXL drop is called Portier drop. Using Portier triangle, we are separating IAXAR. Uh, that is, we are separating IAXL from IAXA. Okay, that is why this is called a Portier triangle. Okay. Now uh, you know the expression, then uh, you know the procedure to calculate the voltage regulation in ZPF method. So this is the comparison. Now the parallel operation. Okay. Now, now uh, assume one alternator. Okay, that alternator uh, delivers energy to the load. Now assume the alternator rating is 1000 kVA, the load requirement is 500 kVA. Okay, now if you assume lossless system, uh, the alternator can easily satisfy the load requirement because the load requirement is 500 kVA, alternator is uh, 1000 kVA. Now the load is increased from 500 kVA to 900. So load, uh, the alternator rating is uh, 1000. Now also the alternator can satisfy the load. Now the load increased from 900 to 1500. Now the alternator rating is only 1000. Now what you have to do, how will you satisfy the load? Either you have to replace this 1000 kV alternator by 1500 kV alternator. Okay. So if you do that, the initial cost is more. Okay. Instead of that, you can add additional one alternator, 500 kV alternator with the existing alternator. Now the load requirement is 500 kV. The generating capacity is also 1500. Okay. Now we can easily satisfy if you assume lossless system. If you assume last, uh, last system, so for 1500 kVA, you need, you need to uh, install uh, more than 1500, 1700 or 1800 based on the losses. Okay. Now, uh, straight away you can connect this alternator with the existing uh, uh, alternator or bus bar. For that, uh, <coughs> there is a certain procedure. So you have to follow that procedure and condition. So there are three conditions. One is the terminal voltage. Incoming alternator terminal voltage should be same as that of the uh, bus bar terminal voltage or existing alternator terminal voltage, then phase sequence, then frequency. This three condition you have to satisfy. Once you have three, uh, satisfied these three condition, you can add this alternator with the existing alternator or bus bar. Okay, you have to uh, follow the same order. Okay, first you have to uh, satisfy the voltage, next phase sequence, next uh, uh, frequency. Uh, you should not change the order. Okay, so for that, uh, once you can satisfy this condition, you can add n number of alternator with the existing bus bar or existing alternator. Okay. So for that, we have three basic methods. <coughs> one is three dark lamp method, two bright and one dark lamp method, and another one is synchroscope. So three dark lamp method means, so just this is the synchronizing switch. Synchronizing switch is nothing but combination of TPST switch, that is triple pole single throw switch. Then uh, in each leg you will have the lamp, uh, normal incarnation lamp. Okay. The arrangement of lamp and uh, switch is called uh, synchronizing switch. Okay. So here this voltmeter uh, used to measure the bus bar terminal voltage. This voltmeter is used to measure the terminal voltage of the incoming alternator. Okay. Now this is G1 is the existing alternator, G2 is the incoming alternator. That means we are going to connect the incoming alternator with the the existing alternator. Okay, so first we have to uh, check the condition. So uh, first, suppose the voltage is 400 voltage. So this voltage, uh, uh, voltmeter also uh, should read 400 voltage. So how will you increase this voltage by adjusting the field winding? Here there is a field winding. By adjusting the field current, you can increase the plus so that the voltmeter uh, volt voltage increases in the second alternator. Okay, so now once you match these two alternators, voltages, uh, first condition over. The second condition, phase sequence. If all the lamps, if all the lamps simultaneously are on and off, the phase sequence is correct. If uh, not simultaneously on and off means the phase sequence is wrong. You have to switch off the alternator, you have to change the any two terminal of the incoming alternator. Okay, once the phase sequence is uh, correct, all the lamps will simultaneously on and off. Then uh, third one is terminal uh, frequency, the flickering rate. Okay, the flickering rate is more. Flickering rate is more. The terminal voltage is uh, the flickering rate is more. The incoming alternator running uh, fast or slow. 
By adjusting the frame over of the incoming alternator, we can adjust the frequency. Once you can satisfy all these three conditions, you can close the switch. When you have to close the switch means if these three lamps in dark condition. That is why this is called uh, three dark lamp method. So this is called two bright and one dark lamp method. So what is the difference between two bright one dark lamp method means here uh, we have one lamp in each uh, each pole we have one lamp. Here the lamps are not like that. Yeah, it is connected in transposed manner. This is the difference. Because of that the lamps will uh, at a time any two lamps will uh, on and one lamp will be in half condition. That is why this is called two bright and one dark lamp uh, arrangement. Then synchroscope. Compared to first two methods, the synchroscope method is the sophisticated method. So first two methods, we need the skilled operator. Why we need skilled operator means you have to judge the exact instant at which the synchronous switch should be closed. But here, there is a one dial. So if the dial goes this side, yes side, that means the incoming alternator running uh, slow. That means you can increase the speed of the prime mover incoming alternator frame over. If this pointer goes this side, F side, that means the incoming alternator running fast. You have to decrease the speed of the incoming alternator. If this uh, pointer stands vertically, this is the exact instant we can close the switch. Okay, so sophisticated method, this is the synchronous code. Okay. So, uh, three dark lamp method, three, two bright and one dark lamp method and another one is synchronous code. So, next is synchronizing action. This is important. Once you synchronize the, both the alternator, okay, so this is the equivalent circuit. This is alternator one, arm two resistance, then this is the synchronous uh, impedance. The second alternator resistance, synchronous impedance, these two alternators are running in parallel. Okay. So now, uh, once uh, these two alternators are running in parallel, so the low, uh, both the current, this is current, I1 is the current delivered by first alternator, I2 is the current delivered by the second alternator, I is the load current. You can apply each of current law here, sum of the incoming current equal to sum of the outgoing current, I1 plus I2 equal to I, I is the load current. Okay. So now, uh, <coughs> With respect to external circuit, the E1 and E2 in opposite uh, same direction. With respect to local circuit, E1 and E2 in the uh, opposite direction. Okay. Now, uh, I, uh, that is synchronizing current. So the synchronizing current is the uh, ER divided by two ejectors. So in case of two alternator, so ER, ER is the resultant voltage between uh, these two terminals. Then two ejectors, one ejectors, then another one ejectors, two ejectors. So normally in any alternator, the R2 resistance is negligible compared to synchronous reactors. Okay, excess. Okay, that is why if you neglect the R2 resistance, the synchronizing current ISY equal to ER divided by two excess. Okay. Now assume uh, the first uh, second alternator. I am reducing the speed of the second alternator. This is the synchronizing uh, action is the important concept. Uh, even this will be useful in case of uh, power system analysis. Okay, so now assuming you can assume two alternators running in parallel with the low load. Now, now I am increasing this is second alternator. I am decreasing the decrease uh, decreasing the speed of the decreasing the speed of the first uh, second alternator. So if I am decreasing the speed of the second alternator, for example. So E1, okay. So E1 and uh, E2. So under normal case, E1 and E2 only need to out of this. Now I am uh, decreasing the second alternator, speed of the second alternator. Uh, I am decreasing the speed of the second alternator. So this vector swings this direction. So E2. Okay, so now the angle is not uh, 180 degree, not 180 degree out of this. So the vector is swing, okay, this direction. So automatically the resultant current will create. So E1 minus E2 will create. That is called the resultant current that will create in the local circuit. So this is the resultant current, okay. So this is E1 minus E2, okay. So this is ER, okay, resultant uh, voltage. Next, once there is a resultant voltage here, in this path there is a resultant voltage, in this path, there is the resultant voltage, what will happen? Automatically current will flow. Because in any circuit, there is a voltage and there is a closed path, 
current will flow. So automatically the current will flow. That current is nothing but synchronizing current. So what is the angle between the resultant voltage and synchronizing current? 90 degree, almost 90 degree lagging. Because in any alternator, so this is the, uh, what is the impedance in that path, synchronizing current path? Uh, this RA and XS and this uh, second alternator XS and RA. Normally the arm 2 resistance is negligible. So in that path, normally we can consider as a inductive path. So pure inductance path, the current is lacks voltage by 90 degree. So this is the ER, that voltage, this is current, okay, this is 90 degree. Okay, this is ISY, synchronizing current. Now this ISY is in, uh, in the direction of E1, but opposite to E2. So in the direction of E1 means, this is the generating current for E1. Generating current for E1, motoring current for E2. Okay. So ISY is the generating current for E1, motoring current for E2. So here I have reduced to the speed of the second alternator. I have reduced to the speed of second alternator. So this ISY, motoring current for the second alternator. So motoring current means that we will oscillate to the generator. That will generate a oscillating car. That will oscillate the uh, generator. That means uh, the speed of this alternator will increase. So the vector once again it will swing to this direction, comes to this position. That means 180 degree out of it. Once this vector comes to this, uh, this position, what will happen? ER is 0. Once ER is 0, ISY is 0. That means once synchronized, this is important, once synchronized, both the alternator will run synchronized condition. Okay, so if you decrease the speed of any one alternator, here if you reduce the speed of the second alternator, okay, the vector swings, automatically the resultant voltage will come, that will create the current, ISY, that current, accelerate the lagging machine, decelerate the leading machine. Here which one is lagging machine? Second machine, because we reduce, purposely we are reducing the second machine. Okay, so that ISY accelerate the lagging machine, second machine, decelerate the uh, first machine, leading machine. Okay, so finally both the machine will run at the same speed. Okay, so even there is any disturbance due to external uh, factor, so it will not come out of synchronization. This is the concept. Okay, once synchronized, always it will be in synchronized condition. Okay, so that synchronizing current will produce synchronizing torque. That synchronizing torque may be accelerating torque or decelerating torque. So for lagging machine, it may be it will be accelerating torque as an accelerating torque. For leading machine, it will be decelerating. Eh? It will be decelerating torque. Okay. So uh, we have the expression for synchronizing current. So that the expression is uh, ER divided by two Xs. Okay. Now similarly, now we can uh, say the second alternate speed is increased. So, so far I have decreased the speed of second alternator, decreased the speed of second alternator, right? Now I am increasing the speed of second alternator. So, instead of vector swing this direction, now swings this direction because I am increasing the uh, second alternator. So, what will happen? ER comes. So, from ER to 90 degree lagging ISO. Now, this ISO is the generator current for E2, motor current for E1. Okay, so that means this ISO decelerate to the second machine, accelerate to the first machine. Correct? Correct. Now I increase the speed of second alternator. So this is the leading machine. So the decelerating torque acts on the second machine, accelerating torque acts on the first machine. Okay. So this is called synchronizing action. Now you know the expression for synchronizing power and synchronizing torque. Now, uh, now assume uh, there is a two alternator running in parallel running in parallel, uh, assume both alternator impedance are same, okay, same rated alternator, that means uh, both alternator will share equal real power and equal reactive power. So now, uh, I know, I think you know this thing. So now, if you increase any one alternator speed, two alternator running in parallel, if you increase any one alternator speed, that alternator share more real power. Okay. So if you increase any one alternator excitation, that alternator will serve more reactive power. Okay. So if both alternator in running in parallel with equal rating, equal capacity, equal impedance, that will serve equal real power and equal reactive power. This is normal case. 
Okay, suppose uh, uh, one alternator, first alternator speed you are increasing. Mechanical input you are increasing means you are increasing the input. Mechanical input that means you are increasing the speed. That means that particular alternators have more real power. Okay, suppose one alternator excitation you are increasing means that will uh, serve more reactive power. Okay, so this idea you can have. Next, uh, synchronous motor. So, in synchronous motor, you know the self, not self-starting motor. So, in case of DC motor, it's a self-starting motor. Whenever armature and field uh, system receives the electric energy, the motor action takes place. Whereas, the synchronous motor is not self-starting motor. There is uh, uh, no constructional difference between uh, synchronous generator and uh, synchronous motor. You know the DC motor construction and the DC generator construction. Uh, same construction because same machine capable of operating in uh, motor mode as well as generator mode. Like that, the synchronous machine is also op capable of operating in motor mode and generator mode. Okay, so in case of motor generator mode, you have to give mechanical input, electrical output you are getting. So in case of uh, motor, you have to give uh, electrical input, you will get mechanical output, correct? So now uh, uh, the main source for a synchronous motor is the rotating magnetic field. Okay, so there are uh, Generally, we have say three magnetic fields. Right? It may be steady magnetic field, or alternating magnetic field, or rotating magnetic field. You have to know the difference between these three. Steady magnetic field means if you have one coil, if you excite that coil with uh, DC supply, that will produce the steady magnetic field. So, or if you have permanent magnet, the magnet uh, flux produced by permanent magnet is the steady magnetic field. So, alternating magnetic field example is transformer. So, you are exciting the winding with the alternating supply. Okay. AC, single phase AC that will produce the alternating magnetic field. But rotating magnetic field is different from the alternating magnetic field. To produce rotating magnetic field, you need at least two phases with some phase difference. At minimum, you need two phases with some phase difference. Okay, that will produce the rotating magnetic field. So now, uh, this is the rotating magnetic field. Similarly, any alternating quantity you can represent it in three ways. Okay, so either you can represent in waveform or you can represent in equation or you can represent in vector. This is the waveform representation of green phase system, this is equation representation, this is the vector representation. Okay, so now uh, you can have the uh, rotating magnetic field. So, like that, the magnetic field is rotating. So, uh, n pole and s pole means this will rotate. Okay, alternating magnetic field here n and s means uh, uh, next instant here n comes to lower side, lower side S yes, goes to upper side, like that it will alternate, okay. So here rotating magnetic field. So you know the magnitude of the rotating magnetic field, that is uh, 3 by 2 pi m, that is 1.5 times the maximum uh, plus. Okay, the magnetic field will rotate. So if you have a permanent magnet, okay, N and S, if you are rotating like that, like that, uh, that is the rotating magnetic field. Uh, magnet, you are rotating, okay. So the speed of the rotating magnetic field, uh, speed of the rotating magnetic field you can found uh, by using the mathematical expression ns equal to 120 f by p okay that is supply frequency is directly proportional to ns where ns is the uh, speed of the rotating magnetic field if, if you uh, assume uh, in india we are using 50 gate system so 50 divided by 2 pole if you assume 2 pole the rotating magnetic field speed is 3000 rpm 3000 times uh, the magnetic field will rotate in one minute Okay, you can imagine one minute, three thousand times it will rotate. Okay, similarly, four pole means thousand pi and Okay, so now the speed of the <coughs> rotating magnetic field. Then synchronous motor is not self-starting. Now uh, assume uh, two pole system. So we have standard n pole and standard s pole. So this is rotating with the speed of uh, three thousand rpm at the time of starting. So at the time of starting, what will happen? The rotor speed is zero. 0 rpm. So at one point of time what will happen? The stator end pole and the rotor end pole comes to closer. So what will happen? The stator end pole and the rotor end pole comes close, closer. So uh, same pole, same pole comes closer. What will happen? It will ripple. So this will ripple this direction. This will ripple this direction. This will, this will not, uh, the rotating magnetic field will not ripple, uh, the rotor will not go this direction because rotating magnetic field going this direction. Okay. So after some time what will happen? So this SS comes here, NS comes here, after 0.01 second. So 3000 RPM means in RPS you can convert, then for half rotation, half rotation 0.01 second. This is 1 second, okay. Uh, 0.01 second, after 0.01 second, this NS comes here, this SS goes to this side. So now what will happen? Opposite pole. So this SS attract rotor end pole. 
So after 0.01 second, 0.01 second means very very small time. Okay. So once again this LS comes here. Yes, yes. Once again the same port comes closer. So refer like that. The rotor port will oscillate only. It will oscillate. Okay. So because you have the inertia of the rotor, the rotor will not respond. Okay. Because rotating magnetic field is high. So the rotor synchronous motor is not self starting. So for that we have we need the rotating. That is we need the frame mover to make the self start. So for that you can use any DC motor. Using DC motor you can rotate the rotor uh, near uh, synchronous speed. At one point of time what will happen means uh, the rot uh, rotor, uh, rotating magnetic field opposite pole locked with the uh, rotor pole opposite pole. Okay. So once locked the uh, uh, motor runs with the uh, synchronous speed. So synchronous motor always runs with the synchronous speed. Okay. So in, in case of DC motor if you increase the load what will happen? Uh, speed decreases. But in case of synchronous mode, even though if you increase the load, speed is constant. Synchronous motor speed is uh, constant. So this is called a constant speed motor. Okay. So synchronous motor is a constant speed motor. It will run either at synchronous speed or zero speed. Okay. Only two state. So now uh, another one, uh, starting method is damper winding. So damper winding is nothing but like screw case winding. In case of uh, induction motor, you have a screw case winding. Like that in all the pole faces there is a uh, winding. That is called uh, damper winding. So if, if the rotor comes out of the synchronism, there is the speed difference between rotating magnetic field and rotor speed. So automatically the EMF it gives in the rotor pole. That is uh, in a bar, screw cage bar. So that will produce a supply. That flux strength increases, that will lock with the rotating magnetic. Once again, it goes to synchronization. So, that is called the, uh, this is the function of the damper winding. Okay, so this is the back EMF, like a DC motor, like DC motor, there is a back EMF in a synchronous motor. Okay, what is the expression for back EMF in DC motor? Same expression of the uh, generated expression. Okay, like that here, uh, back EMF expression is uh, same as that of the E phase expression, that is 4.44 kc kt phi m t phase. Okay, so this is the voltage equation. Uh, in case of uh, synchronous uh, motor, V phase. V phase is the supply voltage. E B phase is the back EMF. I A equals is the drop. Okay. Tell me what do you want? Okay. So the supply voltage is supposed to balance the back EMF on the drop. This is the idea. Okay. The supply voltage is supposed to balance the back EMF and uh, drop. I A equals drop. From that we can derive the current. So I A equal to V phase divided by E B phase divided by E B phase vector, E B phase minus E B phase divided by E jetters. Okay. Now uh, the synchronous motor has no load. Then uh, if you increase the load, what will happen? So once the rot uh, rotor is locked with the rotating magnetic field, uh, both of them will uh, exa in exact synchronism. If you increase the load, what will happen? The rotor try to come out from the synchronism. So this angle is called delta. So in uh, no load condition, the rotating magnetic field axis and rotor magnetic axis will be in exact synchronism. That means the delta equal to zero. Delta is the load angle or torque angle. Okay. Then if you increase the load, what will happen? The rotor try to come out from the synchronism. So the delta will come into picture. If you increase the load, delta will increase. If you decrease the load, delta decreases. Okay. Lesser delta, uh, if load uh, less, less, delta less and so on. Okay. Now uh, this is the case. Okay. So here, zero load, okay, load is zero, delta equal to zero. We are increasing load, slightly the delta increases. More load, more delta. So now, uh, similarly, if delta, if delta equal to zero, the current is zero. What is the current? B phase minus EB phase divided by EZ test. Okay, so here, 50% uh, load. So EB phase, so this is B phase. B phase minus EB phase, this is nothing but IA EZ test. In any machine, EZS is constant. That means this is IA. So IA. So more load, more delta. So more length of this uh, ER, that is resultant vector, more ER, more IA. That means if you increase the load, the motor, first uh, delta will increase. If you increase the load, uh, delta will increase. Why delta increases? Because water try to come, uh, come out from the synchronism. So delta increases. If delta increases, 
what will happen? ER phase increases. ER phase increases, IA increases. Okay. So in any motor, if you increase the load, current will increase. Okay, in between. Uh, load increases, current increases. In between, there is increase, increment in the delta. That delta creates the or makes uh, increment in the current. Okay. Now, similarly, if you uh, join all these points, this is called a constant excitation circle. Then, uh, <coughs> torque angle, torque angle characteristics. So, this is generator torque angle, this is motor torque angle. Uh, the maximum uh, torque you can get in synchronous motor at 90 degree. If delta is 90, you get the maximum torque. Okay. So, this is the pull out torque. If delta is more than 90, the rotor comes out of the synchronism. Okay. That means uh, the motor will stop. If less than 90, uh, the motor, there is a motor action. Okay. Now, like that, this is the V curve and inverted V curve. So, V curve is the uh, relation, gives relationship between IA and field current. Then, inverted V curve is the gives relationship between power factor and field current. So, uh, so in any case, so if you increase the excitation at one point, the motor, this is the unique, unique feature of the synchronous motor. So in case of induction motor, you cannot control the power factor. Induction motor always runs with the lagging power factor. But in case of synchronous motor, it is capable of operating in all the power factor. Either you can operate in lagging power factor condition or leading power factor condition or unity power factor condition. How you can achieve this means by varying the excitation. If you achieve uh, under excitation, if you perform under excitation, what will happen means the motor run in the lagging power factor condition. So if you, uh, excite, if you increase the excitation, that is over excited condition. If you operate the motor in over excited condition, the motor running in leading power factor condition. So at a particular point, uh, by adjusting the uh, excitation, even you can achieve the unity power factor. Okay, this is the unique feature of the uh, synchronous motor. No other motor performs like that. Okay, so only a unique feature of the synchronous motor. So this is the V curve. The, this curve looks like an English letter V. That is why it is called V curve. Then inverted V curve. Okay, so here even under excitation, the current motor takes more current, over excitation also motor takes more current. At one point, the uh, current takes, uh, the motor takes minimum current. That point is called the unity power factor point. Okay. Then this is the power expression, input power and power development expression. Then uh, how will you reverse the synchronous motor? So how will you reverse the DC motor? Either by changing the armature terminal or field terminal. How will you reverse the uh, uh, synchronous motor? By changing the phase sequence. The only source is rotating magnetic field. By changing the rotating magnetic field, you can uh, change the rotating direction of the synchronous motor. Then how will you control the speed of the DC motor? How will you control? Only possible is frequency. By adjusting the frequency, you can control the speed of the rotating magnetic field. You know the expression for the speed of the rotating magnetic field. N s equal to 120 F by P. F and the N s is directly proportional. P is also inversely proportional, but you cannot change the number of poles. Once motor is designed, you cannot change the number of poles. Only readily, readily available parameter is frequency. Okay. By adjusting the frequency, you can control the speed so that you can control the rotor speed. Then losses. Then you know the what are the losses in the synchronous motor. Then uh, hunting. Okay. So uh, hunting you can uh, avoid uh, by using the damper winding. <coughs> then importance of power factor. Okay. So uh, if power factor is less, power factor is less, the motor takes uh, more current. Okay. So for example, you can take the. Uh, uh, single phase system, this is the P equal to P i cos by, okay, so I equal to P divided by D cos by. Suppose uh, the power is 1000 watts, okay, so power is 1000 watts, say 1000 watt lamp, uh, voltage is 200, so this is 0.2, our factor is 0.2, so uh, what will, uh, so 50, 5, uh, 5, this is uh, 1 by 5, 25 ampere will come. So if power factor is 0.2, the current is uh, 25 ampere. Similarly, I equal to P divided by V cos by, so V is 1000, same uh, load I am taking, so voltage is 200, now power factor is 1. Now what is the current taken by the motor? 5 ampere. Okay. So now we can uh, see the importance of the power factor. Just by changing the power factor, you can uh, reduce the current run by the motor. If power factor is poor, so power factor is 0.2, okay, the same load, same wattage. Uh, load uh, uh, rating is same, 
same supply voltage, but uh, the current taken by the uh, load is 25 amperes, 5 times more. Okay, but uh, the power factor is unity improved. If you improve the power factor, the current drawn by the motor is less. Okay, so this is the importance of the power factor. So if you operate any synchronous motor in over excited condition, okay, that will act as a synchronous conductor. So what is the function of condenser? Condenser means capacitor. Okay. When you will use to improve the power factor. Like that, synchronous motor going to act as a synchronous condenser. So condenser is a static piece of apparatus. Synchronous motor is a rotating machine. So that is why this is called a synchronous condenser. Okay. Then three phase induction motor, you know the construction and operating principle. Okay, so the outermost part of the machine is called the yoke. Okay, so this gives the mechanical support to the entire machine. Then uh, similarly, the stator are made up of number of stamping. So this is called uh, stamping. Okay, so this is the front view of the stamping. The each stamping 0.5 mm thickness, made up of uh, silicon steel. Each stamping is uh, laminated. Then uh, uh, according to code length, all the stampings are arranged. Then uh, winding, three phase winding you can place. Then uh, this is the stamping arrangement. Then rotor, there are two types of rotor, one is full cage rotor and another one is slipping rotor. So uh, uh, the rotor stamping will be like this. Okay, so there is a uh, stamping, so soft, so outer periphery there are a number of stops. Normally the slot is in down shape. Okay, so this is the front view. We can add all the stampings. So finally under hydraulic plus we can plus. Then it looks like a solid metal. Then in that hole we can pour the melt, we can melt the aluminium and we can pour. Then uh, that will form a winding. Then both the side we can have the uh, entry, okay, to uh, close the rotor winding. Okay, so this is the uh, construction of the rotor. So here this is the uh, entry. This is one entry and this is one entry, two entry. This two entry uh, uh, closes the rotor winding, okay. Then this is the same, you know the how uh, uh, rotating magnetic field is created. You give three phase supply, rotating magnetic field is created, you know the uh, function. Then uh, the speed of the rotating magnetic field, you know, 120 mpp. Then uh, now you have the uh, stata, in stata you are placing the rotor, okay? So now, Because, eh, 
induction motor always runs below single rest speed. If suppose uh, uh, the rotor runs near single rest speed, what will happen? Uh, rotor runs at single rest speed. Is it possible in induction motor? Not possible. If rotor runs near single rest speed, what will happen? There is no relative speed. I am already mentioned. Okay. For EMF induced, we need plus conductor, then relative speed. If rotor runs single rest speed, there is no relative speed. No relative speed, there is no EMF induced. No EMF induced, there is no current flow. Correct. No current flow, no code induced. There is no code induced, no catching tendency. That means induction motor never runs at the single rest speed. At least there is a 1 RPM difference. Minimum 1 RPM difference. Okay. Induction motor never runs at the single rest speed. Single rest motor always runs at the single rest speed. Okay. So now, what is the difference between uh, transformer and uh, induction motor? So transformer, how the EMF is induced in uh, secondary of the transformer? Due to induction. Correct. How EMF induced in the rotor of the uh, induction motor? Due to induction. Correct. That is why this is called induction motor. Okay. Uh, induction motor because rotor gets current due to induction. That is why this is called induction motor. The other name for induction motor is the rotating transformer. Rotating transformer. Because in transformer, both primary and secondary stationary, here you can consider the stator as a stationary, rotor is the secondary, but rotor is allowed to rotate. So the induction motor also called as rotating transformer. Okay. Now this you know, then slip. Slip equal to NS minus NR divided by NS. Uh, what is the slip in case of uh, single NS motor? Zero. Because NR is NS. Okay. Single NS motor, uh, rotor always runs at single NS speed. So NS minus NS, zero. Okay. So slip is zero. So single NS motor always runs with zero slip. Uh, single NS induction motor always runs with some slip. Okay. So NR not equal to zero. Okay. Slip value at the time of starting. At the time of starting, what is NR? NR equal to zero. So in this expression, if you substitute NR equal to zero, NS divided by NS. That is one. So the slip value maximum one. Then uh, if rotor gathers speed, the NR comes into picture. Okay. So <coughs> the slip value zero. When it will be zero? It will not be zero. Huh? Index, uh, induction motor never runs, runs at zero. That is why I have put zero less than, not less than or equal to. Okay? Induction motor never runs at zero slip. Okay? Between zero and one it will run. Okay? So why it is called induction motor? You know it is also called as rotating transformer. You know the type of uh, rotor. That is full gauge rotor and uh, slip ring rotor. So most of the motor, 90% of the motor, or, uh, with the screw gauge rotor. Okay. So only specific application we are using the uh, slip ring induction motor. So if, suppose if you want to accelerate the, some torque uh, even at the time of starting, we, uh, we can uh, use the uh, slip ring induction uh, motor. So in slip ring induction motor, uh, we have the actual winding. In uh, screw gauge induction motor also we have winding, but that winding is uh, aluminium bar. So here actual aluminium, copper winding we have. Okay, so the, we cannot access the rotor in case of uh, uh, slip ring, uh, sorry, school gauge induction motor. School gauge induction motor, you, can, uh, you cannot add uh, additional resistance. But in uh, slip ring induction motor, you can add the external resistance. By uh, adding the external resistance, you can increase the starting torque. But in uh, school gauge induction motor, you cannot increase the starting torque. One more important thing, the school, uh, slip ring induction motor have good uh, starting torque, but uh, Slipping induction motor have good starting torque for running uh, performance. But uh, <coughs> full gauge induction motor have uh, good uh, running performance for starting torque. Okay. Now uh, full gauge induction motor, slipping motor. So here you can see. So the three winding, one end is start, one end is start, other three end is connected with slipping. Through these three terminals, we can add the external resistance. By increasing the resistance, uh, we can add the uh, external resistance so that we can increase the uh, start, starting time. Then one uh, more important, parking and trolley. Uh, okay? Then uh, you know the equivalent circuit. Okay? So equivalent circuit uh, same as that of the uh, transformer. Okay? So the transformation ratio also come. So like transformer, uh, N2 divided by N1, E2 divided by E1 equal to I1 divided by I2. Okay, rotor to stator tense ratio. In case of uh, uh, transformer, uh, secondary to primary, here rotor to stator. Okay, K, transformation ratio. Torque equation you know, T equal to 3 by 2 pi NS, 
into S e2 square r2 divided by r2 square plus h2 square 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 divided